Good morning, Bam. I am delighted to get to be with you. My name is Charles Mickey, and I used to preach for the Bamel Church way back in the 80s. In fact, this is the first time I've preached on a regular Sunday in about 33 years at Bamel, and I am honored to get to do it. Thanks to anybody and everybody who had a hand in or a part of the invitation to come to me. Um, I remember the very first time I stood and preached at Bamel, and uh, I remember the welcome. I remember so many things about it and so many of the people, especially uh, uh, the Moore family, Jack and Iola were delightful and so many others as well. I hope that David Ayers will get the same kind of warm, wonderful welcome uh, when he is in this pulpit in just a few days. So uh, welcome David. And uh, I, I truly, truly hope that this is a blessing, a great blessing for a long time in your life. The people I'm about to name to you are not so welcome in our assembly. In fact, uh, David would be welcomed so much by comparison to these, it's, it's no comparison really. Uh, let me name a few, see if you know them. Um, Cruella, Ursula, Hannibal Lecter, Scar, and Lion King. Now those are all fictional characters, but what, what if I name uh, Benedict Arnold or Judas Iscariot? Now that's the one for Christians who is villain of all villains, perhaps. Uh, the most hated, despised, rejected, uh, and yet I've chosen to speak about Judas this morning. And I know the obvious question is why, Charles? Are you crazy? Have you lost it in your old age? No, I don't think so. In fact, uh, I've been thinking about Judas uh, for a while. I read a book by Colin Smith called Heaven So Near Dash So Far. And uh, that was published in 2017, but I didn't discover it until just a few weeks ago. And I wanna share some insights, not just from that book, from the, but primarily from the study of the Gospels and the book of Acts. Judas was an enigmatic, tragic figure in the Gospels. He plays a key role, though we don't know much about him. And uh, there are so many questions that are left unanswered. In fact, I'm gonna pose some of those questions and leave them unanswered because really we don't have enough information to answer them. Um, could you though, let me ask you the question, could you ever think of yourself as sinning like Judas did? Could I? Are any of us capable of doing something so horrible and hideous and heinous as Judas did? We know Judas. He's the one who betrayed Jesus. He's listed at the end of the 12 apostles, every time they're listed. And almost every time there's a mention of the fact that he betrayed Jesus. And by the way, the word translated betrayed can also mean handed over or delivered Jesus. So there's, there's kind of a double meaning there. Um, I want to propose to you this morning that every one of us is a potential Judas, and I know that's hard to believe. Every one of us, in many ways, is like Judas. Judas is not a helpless victim. Judas is not a pawn on God's chessboard, just moved around to accomplish God's plan. Judas is not a hideous monster. Judas is an average citizen who was chosen and was thrilled to be chosen by Jesus after Jesus prayed all night to pick those 12 apostles. His name, Judas, is common among the Jews, especially after the uh, revolution of, uh, led by Ju Judas Maccabeus. That name became very common after that. His, his second name, or last name we might call it, uh, Iscariot. Is, uh, there's disagreement about what it means. Usually, most everybody agrees it means that he was from the city of Kiriath. But some argue that maybe it was because he was part of a group called Dagger Men and Sicarii, uh, Sicarii uh, depending on how you want to pronounce it, uh, means Dagger Men. But that movement didn't start. The rebels who were part of that didn't really start to do anything until after Judas's death. So I think there's a good case to me that he was not uh, that he was not among that. But Judas, I want to I make clear, I believe, was a man with 
dreams and hopes and ideas and goals and fears and disappointments, frustrations, just like you and just like me. Uh, Judas made a series of choices over and over that put him in a position that for many of us now, we think we can't identify with him at all because we would never even be uh, tempted to do what he did, which was to completely give up on Jesus. And not just that, but to betray him. And, and betrayal is, is a whole nother category of opposition to someone. Uh, most of us have had the terrible experience of having enemies. Yeah, we have enemies. But when you have a friend who becomes an enemy, that's a whole different ball game. And that's exactly what we see in Judas. Let me go back to the beginning with Judas. We don't know when he met Jesus. We don't know how he met Jesus. But uh, uh, Colin Smith in his book imagines that it might have been through the baptism at uh, the Jordan by John the Baptist when Jesus was baptized. Maybe Judas was watching. We don't know. Judas, I believe, was a man with a world of choices, wonderful privileges. Uh, he listened to Jesus teach. He heard the profound teachings of the Sermon on the Mount and so many more. He got to watch as the lame man was let down through the hole in the roof in Capernaum in the house there, probably Peter's house. He got to hear Jesus forgive that man's sins before he even uh, gave him the ability to walk and healed him. Uh, Judas was there when Jesus commissioned the 12 and sent them out to heal miracles uh, or to perform miracles, which included healing and casting out demons and all of that. Judas with the others came back thrilled. They were excited as they could be to tell about what they've been able to do because of the power of Jesus in them. Uh, Judas was there, especially on one occasion, the feeding of the 5,000. You remember that story. It's told in all four Gospels. And at the end of the feeding of the 5,000, according to John chapter 6, Jesus then went into teaching about himself as the bread of life. And he gets into a discussion there about drinking his blood and drinking and, and eating his body that was very tough to handle. The people there and people even today don't know what to do with that. Uh, based on that passage, in fact, Christians have been accused of cannibalism even and rejected on that basis. But at the end of that tough teaching, there were quite a few of the, of the listeners who left. And Jesus turned to his apostles and said, are you going to leave too? And Peter, who was often the foot and mouth, uh, speak first and think later guy, in this case, got it right. And he said to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? Because you have the words of eternal life and we need that. And then, and then Peter went on to say, we believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. But right after that, Jesus says something that really, uh, it, it's powerful, it's easily overlooked. Uh, you might not have ever even noticed that right after Peter makes his great con, uh, conclusion at that point and says, we're sticking with you, Jesus. We believe in you. You're the Holy One of God. And then Jesus says, I have chosen you, the twelve, but one of you is a devil. One of you is a devil. Wow. That's a first hint, I think. Except for, of course, the listings of the apostles where they go on ahead and say, Jesus, I mean, Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus. But when Jesus makes this statement, I'm sure that the apostles wondered, what's that about? Really? Is one of us a devil? Because later, even the night of the Passover meal, Jesus says a word about who's going to betray him. And they all look at each other and say, is it me? Am I the one? Surely not I. In fact, Judas says that. We'll get to that in just a moment. But the point I want to make right here is that uh, uh, Judas had wonderful privileges and blessings and could have learned and did learn, I'm sure, so much. But there was something going on in Judas before that Passover meal and before that deal with the chief priests and all that I want to go back to. And if you have your Bibles, I want to open it to John chapter 12. The beginning of John chapter 12 is a story of Jesus six days before the Passover with his apostles. He has come to the little town of Bethany outside Jerusalem, just an easy walk. 
And he's at the home of Lazarus, whom he had already raised from the dead in chapter 11. And Lazarus' two sisters, Mary and Martha. So they're having a meal, John says, in, the, in Jesus' honor. And at that meal, they're reclined at the table, not sitting in chairs. Mary comes up with a uh, uh, very expensive perfume that, begins, that she begins to pour on Jesus and wash his feet. And uh, in fact, the words say, and then Mary took, uh, then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus's feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Well, stay tuned. Here's what happens next. John says, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Here's what Judas said. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was, uh, it was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, a keeper of the money bag. He used to help himself uh, to, to what was put into it. So already in John chapter 12, way before the, well, maybe not way before, but at least six days before the Passover, and in John's record, several chapters before the crucifixion, we have a hint. John knows, and the others know, that Judas, who is the treasurer for the group, is pilfering. He's embezzling. He takes uh, whatever he pleases. Some even think that it was out of his embezzled money that he bought the field of blood that later comes up in the story. We don't know. Uh, there's a little bit of a uh, back and forth on that. But I want you to see that already in John chapter 12, at this meal in Jesus' honor, Judas is making choices. He's already been making choices. He's stealing from the treasury of the group that's traveling with Jesus. Maybe it started out with just one shekel. Maybe it was uh, one drachma. Maybe it was one denarius. Uh, maybe he just thought, well, I'll put it back. You know, I'll pay it back in. I'll take care of that later. And then there was more, and then there was more, and then there was more until John could say he regularly was stealing from the common purse. Now, here's a thought, and I don't even know who gets credit for this, but I like the way it's put. Someone has written, sow a thought and reap an act. Sow an act and reap a habit. Sow a habit and reap your character. Sow your character and reap your destiny. It may start with just a postage stamp that you're stealing from your business or a pen or an envelope or something else. And I know you, you're not concerned about that and your boss is probably not concerned about that, but that's where thievery can start until it develops and develops and develops until you're uh, guilty of embezzling thousands and hundreds of thousands. That can happen. That's what happened with Judas, I believe. I truly believe that Judas was prompted in his sin primarily by greed. You read all four Gospels and put them together along with the beginning of the book of Acts. I think that's what you're going to see. A man who had choices, and those choices never stopped. God did never give up on him, but he kept making bad choices. Um, likely two days before Passover, recorded in Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 and following, Judas makes a deal. He knows that the chief priests have been looking for a way to arrest Jesus. They didn't want to stir up a riot. They knew the people liked him, and so they wanted to do it privately. And they needed somebody to make sure that they were getting the right person and uh, doing it at the right time in a, in a private location. And so Judas, who has questions galore about Jesus, and who at that point in his life was more caught up in greed than ever before, Judas sneaked away and made a deal with the chief priests, and he said, what will you give me if I deliver Jesus to you? And the answer was 30 pieces of silver. Now here's the exact coin, not, not the very coin, but the same, uh, same kind of coin. This is a shekel we have as an artifact here at the Lanier Theological Library. This, this thing weighs a half of an ounce. And it is worth four days of an average man's wages. Four days of wages. So this would be, when you took 30 of these 
and put them in a bag. And by the way, this is kind of heavy. It's, it, it weighs about the same as three quarters. So you take about 90 quarters and you'll have the weight of 30 pieces of, of these. This is called a shekel, a Tyrian shekel. The Tyrian shekel had more pure silver and that's what the Jewish authorities wanted when the temple tax was paid. It only took a half a shekel per person, but in Matthew 17, uh, Jesus arranges miraculously for Peter to catch a fish and in the fish to pull out this coin, which would pay the temple tax for both uh, Peter and Jesus. And by the way, while I'm at it, I wanna compare that to the size of this little coin. This is totally to the side here. But this tiny little coin is the widow's mite. I don't know if you can get a picture of that or not, but it's tissue thin. It has no weight at all. It doesn't even register on a, on a scale that I've got uh, for such small things. But that, when the, when the widow dropped that one in, Jesus said she's given uh, two of those. She's given more than all the rest because she gave all she had. In contrast to, to Judas, who was offered 30 of these, and he said, all right, uh, done deal. And from that point, uh, scripture tells us in Matthew 26 that Ju Judas is looking for that time and that place where he could deliver and hand over Jesus. Now at the Passover meal, which, uh, you know, well, well, let me back up and say that the, the meal to honor Jesus where he was anointed by Mary in the perfume conversation happened six days before the Passover. The Palm Sunday happened four days before the Passover. G Judas made his deal with the chief priest two days before the Passover. So he has actually been given the 30 pieces of silver, 30 shekels, uh, 120 days wages. Which, by the way, if you calculate at an average uh, very low income, $15 an hour, that's still nearly $15,000 today. You take it up to $20 an hour, and that, that makes it about 19, a little more than $19,000. 30 of these would be equivalent to that. So it's, it's uh, in one sense, it's a lot of money. In another sense, it's not all that much. I mean, you know, 19,000 will buy you maybe a good used car. Maybe two, if you, if you don't care how old it is. <laughs> Mine would sell for a lot less. But uh, anyway, the, the question is, what will it take? for you? What, what kind of temptation? You know, how little will it take? How much will it take? For Judas, it's roughly fifteen to twenty thousand dollars by our standards. Maybe a little more. But when he held the weight of those all together, which was a little less than a pound in his bag, and he carried those to the Passover meal, somehow or another, he thought, I'm a wealthy man. I've got what I need. Uh, this is worth the risk. And he sat down at the Passover meal in that upper room that night. And, you know, by the way, some argue that Judas was on the left of Jesus while John the Apostle was on the right of Jesus. I think you can make a pretty good case for that because when it comes time for Jesus to identify Judas, he said, it's the one to whom I give this piece of bread. John chapter 13 has Jesus giving Judas a piece of bread with which he identifies Judas as the betrayer. And, and John adds this note. When Judas took the bread, Satan entered into Judas. Luke 22 verse 3 has it a couple of days earlier and makes the very same statement that Satan entered Judas. That's two days before the Passover when he's making the deal with the chief priests. And, and those who gave him the 30 pieces. When did Satan enter Judas? Uh, all through this time, <laughs> both times. But what does it mean? I'm not sure, but I'll tell you this I am sure about. Judas never lost his power to choose. Judas never lost his free will. Even when he walks up to Jesus, kisses Jesus, and calls him rabbi, and Jesus says to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? I think Judas still had his choice. Jesus was saying, in effect, don't you want to change your mind? Are you sure you want to do this? A terrible choice. Judas was firm. 
Judas was clear until a little bit later. Judas has watched. Uh, let me back up and say what happened in the garden. The garden scene is curious. And, and we can talk a lot about the different detail. I don't have time for that. But, but I was struck as I studied all of this that it's John 18 that adds an element. He subtracts. John 18 subtracts an element. Does not mention the kiss by Judas, but adds a couple of other elements. When Judas leads this army, I want to call them, a lot of Roman soldiers, we don't know how many, some would estimate even 600. But when, when a whole bunch of Roman soldiers, along with a temple guard, arrive, led by Judas, Jesus steps forward, according to John 18, and says, Who is it you want? Well, he takes the ball. <laughs> He takes the, uh, the conversation by himself and leads it. And they answer Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And John says, when he said, I am he, they drew back and they fell down to the ground. I'm trying to imagine that scene and I'm laughing. These Roman soldiers and, and Judas and the temple guard are all out there with all their torches and their weapons and they're ready to to do this big thing, thinking they might have a, a fight on their hands. Jesus said, am I leading a rebellion that you need to come with all these uh, tools and all these people? I'm the guy you're looking for. Twice in John 18, he says, who is it you want? Who is it you want? And the answer was Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I told you, I am he. So Jesus willingly delivered himself to the soldiers and to the arrest, and then he was taken away. It strikes me, importantly, that God was going to get this thing done with or without Judas. Okay? Judas could have stepped out of the scene, and God's plan would have still happened. Judas was not a pawn. He was not helpless. He wasn't a victim. He was a man making bad choices over and over again. So he kissed Jesus, according to the synoptics, and he calls him rabbi. And uh, they put chains on Jesus as if that would hold him. Jesus said, in fact, hey, I could call down legions of angels. And they would uh, take you out and take care of me. But in fact, what he's saying is I'm willing to do what needs to be done. And of course, later we understand what he was doing. He was atoning for all of our sins. But when Judas watches the trials from a distance... He is, when Judas watches the trials from a distance, he's at a safe distance. He's listening. He's observing. He's watching to, to learn how this thing is progressing. And my goodness, how slowly it went. I mean, all night long, Jesus is taken and dragged before the various uh, chief priests, Sanhedrin. Eventually, they take him, even before dawn, to Pilate. And uh, Pilate, of course, eventually sends him to Herod. Uh, Herod Antipas, and then uh, they bring him back, and then <clears throat> Pilate washes his hand, but he still gives in to the crowd who cries out, hey, if, if, you, don't, if you don't do what we want you to do, then uh, we're going to call you uh, no friend of Caesar's. We're going to report you to Caesar, so to speak. <laughs> we're going to tattle on you. And so uh, Pilate washed his hands, but he still allowed Jesus to be scourged, and he finally agreed to the crucifixion. Uh, when Judas understood that Jesus was condemned, this is the way the synoptics report it, Matthew 27. When Judas understood that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. Okay, now that's an important phrase in uh, the beginning of Matthew 27. He was seized with remorse. What does that mean? The word that's used there in the Greek, metamelomai, uh, can be translated repentance or repent. So there are, there are some who, uh, by reading this passage, say that, that Judas repented. But he didn't know what to do with his repentance, so he just went out and killed himself. Uh, he brought the money back. He says, in effect, I don't want this money. I've betrayed innocent blood. That's good. He recognizes the truth now. But he is filled with remorse, is one way of, of uh, translating this. Another, the King James says, he repented himself. Uh, there are other ways. Uh, Amplified says something about his mind was conflicted or afflicted with uh, trouble, and he was torn by 
the folly of his deeds and so forth. But the truth is, I don't think Judas repented. The word metamelomai is distinct from metanoeo, which is the usual word for repentance. And if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, you'll see Paul draw a distinction between them. And he talks about how that, yeah, you can have regret and you can have remorse and you can be sorry about what was done or what you didn't do. But the truth, uh, the, the most important thing is whether or not you repent. And, and Paul was rejoicing that the Corinthians had repented. And that's a good thing. And he uses the word metanoeo. So I think you can argue from the, the Greek words even that uh, Judas did not repent. Did he repent? I don't know for sure. God knows. But I know that Dante's Inferno has Judas at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of hell. And most people today think of the name Judas Iscariot as the most reprehensible, despicable human being. Maybe he deserves that. I don't know. But I know when he was chosen as an apostle, he was a man with free will choice. And as he watched and learned and could have been transformed by the words of Jesus, instead, he allowed greed to get hold of his heart. And uh, Matthew, in, right after he returned the money, and by the way, it's interesting that the chief priests would not take that money. They didn't want to put it back in the treasury because they called it blood money. So they went out and bought a field uh, called the Field of Blood. And there's a little bit of a problem in uh, the passage about uh, Matthew 27 verses Acts chapter 1 where the question is who bought the field and what money did they use to pay for it? I mentioned earlier that Judas could have bought the money with what he took out of the treasury. But the uh, priest could have bought the, the field rather uh, with the money that Judas threw into the temple. In any case, there was a field called a Keldma. And according to Acts chapter 1, Matthew 27 says Judas hanged himself. Acts chapter 1 says he fell headlong and burst open, his body burst open, and his intestines spilled out. Now, I know that's not a pretty scene, and you don't want to hear about that right before lunch, but uh, that's what the scripture says. Which, which was it? Hanging? And, and, and falling or, or falling. I think it could have been both. Colin Smith makes a good case for that in his little book, Heaven So Near So Far. It doesn't really matter, does it? What matters is Judas is dead. He's guilty as he can be. He is forlorn. He has abandoned Jesus. He's given up on Jesus. And I want to contrast that quickly to a man named Peter. You know the story of Peter. I don't have to read the scriptures that that uh, recite how that Jesus predicted that Peter would deny him three times before the rooster crowed, uh, crowed <laughs> on the, uh, the night that he was going through the trials in the, in the next morning. Uh, Peter did, over and over said, no, 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 not me, not me. I'll stand with you. I'll stand for you. I'll be right there. I'll defend you. And he, and he even grabbed a sword and cut off the, the uh, high priest's servant, uh, Malchus's ear in the garden scene. Jesus healed it back, scolded Peter. Uh, and so Peter, you know, was really proud of himself, I think, until he's watching the trials from a distance and someone says, hey, I think I saw you with Jesus. And he denies it. And then a second conversation, he denies it. And then a third conversation where he brings or he swears in a way, he calls down curses on himself. And he says, I do not know the man. Speaking about Jesus. Okay, here's Judas. He's a sinner. He betrayed Jesus. Here's Peter. He's also an apostle. He denies that he even know Jesus, that he even knows Jesus three times in a row. What's the difference? True penitence. Judas could have come back to Jesus, I believe, even after betrayal, and said, Jesus, I beg your forgiveness. I am guilty. I am so sorry. I will live a life transformed by your love if you'll give me another chance. 
You think Jesus would have forgiven him? Absolutely. How do I know that? <laughs> it's all through the scriptures. It's exemplified in Peter. Peter tells us by his life and by his example, it doesn't matter how you mess up. What matters is whether you come back. Don't give up on your faith. Some of you, brothers and sisters, have, have done that. You've thought this COVID was so bad and so terrible that you just don't want church anymore. <laughs> uh, you, you just don't want to mess with it. It's messed up your life. But I beg you, come back to the Lord. Come back to the church. Like Peter, be reinstated, if you please. You remember that scene at the very end of the Gospel of John where three times Jesus said, Do you love me, Peter? And he just fed them fish and a breakfast on the, on the side of the Sea of Galilee. And Peter says, you know I love you. And Jesus says three times, feed my sheep. One time he says, lambs, take care of my sheep or my lambs. Three times Jesus commissions Peter to live his life for other people, to take care of the sheep that belong to Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the good shepherd. Peter did that. We know what he preached on Acts chapter, in Acts chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost. We know what he did in the, in the weeks and the months and the years that followed. And tradition has it that Peter was crucified like Jesus except upside down. That's what church tradition says about Peter. He refused to be crucified like Jesus. He wasn't worthy. So he was crucified upside down. I don't know how that works. But I do know that Peter was redeemed. Peter is an example to us of a man who sinned terribly, but who came back in faith and who was forgiven. So my question is, can you sin like Judas? Yes. Can you sin like Peter? Yes. Will you? I hope not. But no matter what your sin, however big or however small, by, by the world's standards, they're all big to God, and they all need forgiveness, and they bring you to the foot of the cross with your arms open to receive the forgiveness and the hope that he offers you today. Let's pray. God, thank you for the call of your love on our hearts. Please give us the courage to come back if we wandered away to receive the hope and forgiveness that you give us because of the cross. Help us to follow that example of Peter, not Judas. We pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen.